Hey guys, what's going on? I'm David Avon with my co-host Robert Drysdale, and today we have a very special guest, three-time ADCC National North American Champion. I believe you're the only one to have accomplished that. UFC veteran, Bellator veteran, and soon to be in one FC, Tom DeBlas. Tom, thank you for joining the show. Thank you for having me, man. To uh, I, I would say one American, actually two American legends, right? I mean, I guess Robert is like <laughs> half and half, but two legends nonetheless. You know, I'm a hybrid. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to be here. Awesome. You know, I wanted to start off, Tom, because I followed you on social media for quite a while, and it seems one of the strong themes that I've gotten from you is that you're fiercely and unapologetically loyal to your your family. And I'm not just talking about, like, blood, like children or whatnot, but to, like, your inner circle, you know. And uh, to me, that's something that I respect a lot. I like people who are very loyal. Myself, I've been with the same team, coaches, and people around me for my whole life. I've never really had to switch camps or anything. And I think that's something that's kind of lost in today's generation that's always looking out for, like, what's in it for me, you know, like, and moving around a lot. So I just wanted to pick your brain a little bit on why you came up that way and the, the merits to that. You're right, man. I am. You know, I, I think one of the reasons is, like, uh, I've garnished the respect with the people that I'm close to, so they're very loyal to me. So in return, you know, I'm, I'm loyal to them back. But I also, like you said, like, I think it's, like, kind of, like, in – an older way of looking at things like with my professor Ricardo, like we haven't always been eye to eye on everything. Uh, but he was just my teacher, you know, and, and I saw something today. It, I forget what show it was from. It was like a world renowned professor in college. And he was like, listen, if you miss one class or if you're late to one class, I'm dropping you a grade. If you're late to cl- two classes, I'm dropping you two grades. And like the kids were like, oh, this is not how we learn nowadays. Like, you need to understand, you know, mental health and this and that. And another student that was there, like, raised her hand and said, listen, you're standing among, like, one of the world's best. Just shut up and listen, you know? And I think now, like, that's what I did coming up through the ranks. Uh, And my teacher said jump. I, I, You know, I said how high. I'm not saying that's the right thing, but that's just how I was. And uh, I always knew my day would come if I – stuck with it long enough, you know, and, and I was able to build that loyalty from my own students. But, uh, yeah, I think nowadays it's pretty crazy. You know, it's just like, I get attacked on social media by blue belts, like every day, you know, it's like, (laughs) I I couldn't imagine like when I was like coming up to the ranks, like, just like, you know, making a status, like talking shit about like, ricardo or like hanzo but like you know everybody has a voice nowadays and it makes things entertaining uh i am very much more old school in that sense where i don't like so much i'm kind of like it's different because you know i do talk a lot about respect but i'm also like you see some of my posts you're like man this guy like who is this guy is he a nice guy or is he a maniac and I, i think it just depends on who i'm dealing with you know uh Sometimes I'm I'm very kind and sometimes I'm not. But I, I, I don't like the shit talk. And that's why I like 1FC because I'm not really into the trash talk and stuff like that. That's not who I am, you know? Yeah. No, um, I, and I definitely like the 1FC angle. And that was pretty cool that I saw that you decided to jump in there. I think well, we were talking to Muhammad yesterday, Muhammad Ali. And he would say he didn't want to be in the UFC. And he dropped his MMA aspirations partly because he didn't like the shit talk culture. I was like, maybe one FC might be for you because I like the, like you said, it's a different environment. I had read actually a story from uh, Eddie Alvarez. You know, he got picked up by one FC and on his first fight in there, he ended up losing. And he was used to, I guess, Western culture and UFC where if you lost, they tossed you aside and they didn't want to talk to you. And he was expecting that. But instead, he got invited to a retreat with all the one FC fighters and he was touching a Chatri and all the other guys, and they treated him still like he's actually a human being. And he's like, to him, it was such a foreign experience. And I'm reading that, I'm like, that's so sad that that's the way it is right now, you know, where the fighter is a commodity in the US where you're only as good as your last fight. And the moment you lose, it's like, hit the road, pal, or you gotta prove yourself again, you know? And I hate that part of fighting where 
like particularly you have someone powerful like Dana White, who he has done great things for the sport. I get that, but at the same time, there's certain things that sours me. Like if you watch some of his shows, like the fight, if like you want to fight with Dana White, that that series, that they want you to essentially to whore yourself and do anything you can to impress the boss instead of focusing on like winning the fight. And, I, and to me, I agree. And man, like the American fans are really mean. You know, it's like, uh, it, you know, it's crazy because all the people who talk a lot of shit, like the fans after a fight or loses or whatever, like they really never done it their self. You know what I mean? And if in, until you understand the heartbreak of not even like, man, for me personally, like if I have a bad training day, like if I'm sparring and I have a bad day, like that affects me. Like it really, it ruins my day, you know? And it's like, I just never found pleasure in, in kicking someone when they're down. You know, it's just not who I am. Uh, and one FC isn't like that, man. Like even in the crowd, it's like, it's quiet, you know, like when the athletes are fighting and Chatri, he's the one we developed a friendship and he's the one who invited me personally. Like he messaged me and, uh, man, it's just, they're just an amazing organization that even after I'm done fighting, I, I hope to work with them still, you know, like, uh, I run ADCC North America. I would love to do something with them, figure something out. And, uh, you know, I believe in my brand. I'm always building my brand and always trying to become better somehow. Jiu-Jitsu is like a, a tool for me to to have a voice, you know. And I never thought I would want to fight again, but this quarantine really, like, man, it got me so upset. You know, like, uh, over the last few months, like, people's lack of compassion for businesses failing and 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 people losing their livelihood, I just, you know, it it, it upset me. You know, and it just brought back a, a fire that I didn't know I had. So we'll see. I'm not going in there saying I'm going to do this or that. I'll, I'm just going to fight hard. That's all I can promise. You know, win, lose, or draw, I'm going to give my best. That's awesome, man. Like, that's a, how old are you, Tom? I'm 38, you know, and ironically, I I feel I was always more of a stand up fighter when I fought MMA, believe it or not. And uh, I got that old man strength now. I'm, I'm cracking pretty hard. You know, it's uh, it's good. interesting. I never That's took good. too much punishment, you know. I never been knocked out, so I mean, the two fights I've lost in my career were tough decisions. Uh, I, my training sessions were probably where I, I took most of my my I had most of my wars, and I don't plan on having gym wars anymore. I'm too old. I don't feel like concussing anyone, and I don't feel like getting concussed. One of the reasons I stopped fighting in the past because I would knock out a lot of training partners, and. Uh, these were my friends that I was knocking out. And and one day I woke up, I'm like, man, what, you're hurting people that love you. You know what I mean? And, and it just, I didn't like it. You know, it, 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 it affected me, but now no one believes me yet. My training partners that I'm a different man to spar with, but, uh, I I'm, I'm doing things differently. This, I just want everything to be positive. I'm not getting involved in the drama, the shit talk. Uh, I don't want a anything Nothing but positivity. I'm kind of picking and choosing and creating my own camp. Like I talked to Lovato, talked to uh, Rashad Evans, talked to King Mo. You know, these guys are all willing to help. I got some monsters at my place, and, and we'll see what happens, you know? Well, well you, you mentioned, like, uh, going back to that 1FC thing you guys were talking about a second ago, I, I've always wanted to fight in pride. That was always my dream. And now 1FC is kind of taken. They're not originally from Japan, but, you know, they still share a lot of the same fan base, I believe. And above all, they share that culture. And I, and I couldn't agree more with you guys about the, the, the air of respect, you know, that you get in the place like that. We we're talking with Muhammad Ali about this. And he goes, in the West, it's always viewed as a bar fight. You know, a fight is a bar fight. 100%, and over man. there, it's a ceremony. No matter how you cut it, win, lose, or draw, you're going to get so much respect and love from the fans. And I don't think you should be fighting for that. You know, I don't think that's that, that should not be the reason why you get into a cage and fight. But it is nice to know that the person that who are you are trying to entertain and you're risking your life for doesn't actually hate you. You know, I think that's always been yeah. an issue with like the average UFC fan is that you get actual hate from them. And I'm like, Bro, where does this hate come from? Insane. I don't know you. Like, how dare you speak? Like, how who you think you are? To attack that person in there who's risking and what have you, to entertain you. And what have you done? And what, what have, have they done? done? You know, then normally, and you don't have to dig very deep. It's always like, you know, it's it's the guy who wish he had it. You know, he's yeah. he is admiring you, but he doesn't know how to admire you with nice words. 
he only knows how to admire you by insulting you. But it is a form of admiration, even if it's we don't always take it that way. But I think it's I think that, you know, as much as I dislike the Western crowd and that sort of noise and trash talking, I think that we have to also develop the maturity to see that that's the only way they understand. It's the only way they know of saying, I admire you, because at the end of the day, they're talking about you. Right. So it is a form of it that's, is a form of that's admiration, one even thing. If not direct. Yeah. That's one thing you're right about. Like, uh, you know, one thing I realized is like the more like when we had that, we posted, I posted a training session as soon as the quarantine started and it was like 10 people there. Right. Five of the people didn't train. They just lifted and five of the people lived together, bro. We got mauled and attacked online by like people lost their mind, you know, uh, and that month, my DVD sales were the highest they've ever been. And it, it was very ironic that that was the most hate that I've, I literally, that was the first time I wasn't ready for the hate. It was like, man, this is crazy. Like I've been, I deal with haters daily, but this was like out of control, you know? And I was like, wait a second, there's other guys posting training pictures the same day as we did, but we're the ones just getting obliterated, you know? It was probably because Gordon was in the picture, to be quite honest. But I like, I, I, I don't know. I, I was confused, you know. And it's like at the same time, if they're talking about you, they're keeping you relevant, you know. Oh. But for sure, like, uh, I've never had anyone yet in person, you know, say, you know, I, I every, I, I'm pretty sure a lot of the people who talk bad about me in person, they take pictures with me, or they just put their head down and walk by. But you know, I. I hope that they could find some sense of self-worth or happiness or just to remove the hate that they have in their life. Because I know me personally, I don't hate on anyone. Like even my enemies, I don't hate on them. Like I don't care who accomplishes anything. Like I'm never watching somebody fight and wishing that they lose. I just don't do that uh, because I feel accomplished. You know, I'm, I'm happy with who I am. And I hope that people who find pleasure in kicking people when they're down, you know, uh, Hopefully they could find the same sense of accomplishment so they don't have to do the same. But if it makes them feel better, whatever, man. I don't care. No, I agree with you. It's pretty it's a pretty miserable experience if your highlight of your day is watching somebody lose, you know, or a team lose. It's crazy. I mean, yeah, it's a it's a very negative outlook on life. And oh, it says a lot about now. Yeah, I mean it, in a way, but you know, I wanted to get back to the one FC thing too, what you guys were talking about with the crowd. I, that's one part of it to me. The other part that I like about it is that the, the values being promoted by the organization are congruent with what we, we should be promoting as martial artists, right? On, like, you know, Shachi doesn't even want you saying that I have, well, this is what I heard. He didn't tell me personally. Yeah. He doesn't even want us to call it a fight. He wants us to call it a competition. You know, like, I've never met a promoter like this guy, you know, like I have, like, he's just a good dude, man. You know, and you're right. He's the one that creates the culture, right? Because people are going to follow his, his lead. And I'm sure how hard would it be if like the fighters started coming out and acting a little bit brash, I'm sure that it would be fairly easy to get the fans behind them and to kind of change the culture. But if the leader keeps the culture the way it's supposed to be, the people will follow. And I, I don't really like to follow anybody. I march to my own beat. But I'm gladly proud to follow Shatri's vision. And I'm not just saying this because I just signed. Yeah. I just love what he's doing. He's a man that I can learn from. He's a man that, you know, he he's accomplished so much in his short life. And he didn't come from anything. And and uh, he still stay, stays true to himself, you know. He wears his G-Shock. He drives a Toyota. Wears jeans and a T-shirt. And that's it, man, you know. And it's pretty awesome to see. It carries through to the fighters, and then it carries through to the fans. Yeah, I, I just like that they're espousing what I consider the virtues of martial arts, you know, honor, integrity, and respect. Because it seems to me like it's very, like it, it's jarring to me when we have the UFC and they promote all the trash talk. And it's very, like Robert said, it's like a bar fight, WWE style promotion. Which obviously works, right? Like we can't argue that it doesn't work, but it's kind of conflicting with what we're supposed to be doing with martial arts, right? Because if we want these people to train, you know, I don't want them to train with anticipation. Oh, you know, to be a good fighter, you got to talk a lot of crap, you know, 
put tattoos all over yourself, you know, and, you know, always name call people. Like, that's not what the martial arts was about, you know, to me. You know? No. And, it's, and, and, and so, you get people like, when I announced that I'm, I'm signed, I signed, like, I, man, I had like some guys that like, they're like all one one or like never even fought. Oh, I want to fight you. Like, bro, like, who are you? Like, like, don't talk, like prove your, yourself, earn your spot, you know, and, and get there. If you, if you want to fight, get relevant enough, like through actually winning, right. To, to where, yeah. Okay. Then we could stand across from one another until then. Like, just, that's the thing, man. Everybody thinks that the, it's, you know, I'll compare trash talk to a heel hook, right? Uh, everybody thinks they could heel hook their way to the top. So nowadays you find blue belts not working on fundamentals because they're never going to fundamentally arm bar black belt, but they can catch that heel hook, right? So instead of winning multiple titles, instead of earning your way to the top, if I just piss someone off enough or bring enough attention to me, maybe I could get that big money fight. But do you really want to be the guy that is known for running his mouth and, and doesn't win, you know, and just makes a mockery of himself? Like for me personally, I cannot sell my soul. You know, like I, I, I know that there's I know I'm not always uh, listen, I'm, I'm a big Jesus fan and I love Jesus because I need Jesus. I, I fail daily. I make mistakes daily. I'm a maniac, you know, and that's one of the reasons I have a lot of loyal people to me, you know, uh, because they know I'm, I'm a good guy to have in their corner. But I, I do my best to to try to become better. And uh, a lot of people don't, you know, like I, I, I know there's kids looking at me that like I'm an example to them. You know what I mean? And I have my moments, but overall, I, I don't think you could say like I've, I've done any. I've never like talked bad about an innocent dude or like attacked somebody for no reason. Like I just that's just not in me, man. You know, like. Uh, but a lot of people, they don't care. You know, it's just who they are. And all it is is the, like we said, right, any, any talk of relevance is just it makes you relevant. So some people don't care if they're hated or loved, you know, it, and it is what it is. But sometimes people like, you get guys like Dylan that, <laughs> I don't know, he's in his own world. And, you know, whatever, I'm not talking bad about him, but like, he still doesn't get like tons, like he gets hate, but not tons of hate, which I, I, it's mind blowing. You know, I can, I can never imagine saying or doing like if I did some of the shit that he did, I couldn't even, the internet would explode. I couldn't even imagine, you know? <laughs> well, we're, we're living at a time where people confuse information with formation, you know, yeah. they get these two things conflated. So you get these internet experts that like to talk trash and they like to try to put other people down and they think they can tell you it's the blue belt that, like you said, he wants to skip the fundamentals because he's got it down, right? Yeah. He's got a YouTube, 100%. he's got a phone that has a YouTube app. So in his mind, he's an expert. And, and I think it's a reflex of, of, uh, of millennials and a young generation in general. Whereas, you know, we, I, I don't, I don't think that having information makes you an expert is being able to digest information and be critical of it makes you an expert, right? Like I can pick a video, I can watch a video, you guys can watch a video, you can pick it apart. Like this guy knows what he's talking about. I can listen to him for 15 seconds and I know this guy's talk, you know, if he knows what he's talking about or if he's a fraud. Whereas the blue belt is watching that video and he's going, I like this guy, I'm gonna repeat what he says because he speaks it with confidence, it sounds like he makes sense. And anyone who knows anything about martial arts is like, man, you have no idea what you're talking about, right? Yeah. But and the internet that has that power to do that, to make everyone an expert. And it's, it's kind of like, it, it's in detriment of critical thinking, you know, which is really what experience will give. You don't get this without, you know, experience. And, and fans are fans, man. Like, they don't have that. So they just want to pretend that they do. You know, it's the, it's the, it's the zeitgeist, you know. It's the, it's the current age we're living in. And it, it's, it's unfortunate, but... I, I don't think it's going to get better, man. I think it's just... No, bro, it's not. I think it's going to get worse, man. It's the age where you're driving down the street and kids don't move out of the way on their bike because they think that they don't have to. That's yeah. the age you're living in. They there There's not very much respect, you know? They don't respect the time put in. They don't respect, like... Uh... It's crazy, man. Like, I remember, actually, like... Robert, I believe I was... It was 2007, I believe. Uh, I actually placed the Mundials as a brown belt, and I think you were in the finals with Hodger. And then before that, David, you were like, 
I was a white belt, like I, bro, like just like a, a nobody. And you were just like killing everybody in like Grappler's Quest and Grappler's Quest super fights back then, like all the big dogs, like everybody, like Drawa C, Shanji, Ricardo Almeida, probably you, Robert. I'm not sure. Everybody like had Grappler's Quest super fights back then, you know. So I remember thinking like, like even for me now to be on this podcast is like, wow, like this was pretty awesome, you know what I mean? Because I, I always just have that. Unless someone like disrespects me, right? I'm always gonna have that respect for the ones who came before me. That's just how I am, you know. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you guys like people look at me as an OG. I'm a baby compared to you guys. You know what I mean? And it's like uh, you guys are winning shit before I even won anything. You know, like be, like literally before I even started training. Like Rob, you were a world champion. Like uh, David, you were like competing in ADCC when I was like a blue belt. This crazy man, you know. And that's something that I appreciate. But nowadays, like, you, you and they all, <laughs> the ones who talk shit kind of all look the same. Like, it, it's hard to, like, I just know what they're going to look like when I click on their profile. Like, uh, <laughs> and, and it's just like, man, like, where they train, I, 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 like, I couldn't imagine one of my students doing you know, and we, you know, we could say Gordon this. Now, Gordon is not my student. Let's let's not get it. You know, I love Gordon as like a brother. I scratch my head, and we've had many, many, many disagreements about how he goes about things. You know, uh, but my own t- students, right? Like, if I had a blue belt, and and one thing we say about Gordon, like he, listen, I don't agree with what he does, but the kid, he wins. If I had a blue belt who's never done anything, like just viciously attacking. Like Carlson Gracie online, I'd be like, bro, what are you doing right now? Like, stop. I would be so apologetic. Yeah. I would like, I would message it. I'd be like, man, like, it's just, and you're right, it's not going to get better. It's not, you know? Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. I think uh, what we have, and as time goes on, we have less consequences for making mistakes, right? And that's a bad thing. You know, a lot of people think, oh, the more lenient you are, people can learn from their mistakes. It doesn't really work that way, right? Oh, like, man. The more lenient you are, it means the more people are going to get away with things. You know, it's like, it's like trying to give a kid a long leash and see what happens. You know, like, they're going to go and go wild because they're always going to test the boundaries. And if the consequence is mild, it's like, oh, it doesn't really even matter. You know, like, just to give you an example from my own life, I know, like, and, you know, when you put those road signs on the street for like advertisements, you're not supposed to do that, right? But when you find out, at least back like when we were doing this like 15 years ago for my gym, is that they would warn you like five times and then the penalty was like 10 bucks. And you're, you're like, like whatever. Oh, yeah, it's cheaper than advertising. So like, might yeah. as well put these things up everywhere. And you know, we just lit yeah. the streets of it. We would go out, we had teams at midnight that were just planting signs everywhere, you know? And it was cool because the consequence was minimal. But uh, it's the same thing now. Like, you know, I feel like <laughs> like sometimes I get into it with my girlfriend because we have arguments. And I'm like, if you were a dude, you would have your <laughs> ass beat so much. <laughs> you know, because you have no idea what you've been getting away with. Yeah. It's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, you just don't understand. Because as a guy, the type of shit you say sometimes would get your ass kicked, you know? But nowadays, that's not even true, you know? Like, nowadays, no. you can say some outlandish you, you stuff can. and, like, you slide. Well, here's the thing. I had somebody come on my post yesterday. It was the craziest thing. And he just viciously started attacking me and accusing me of taking steroids. And then he wanted to drop a contract that we bet each other that if he, if I got, tested for steroids like he gets five thousand if i lose they're like you wanted to make this contractual agreement and just calling me names attacking me and then i had some of my followers attack him back when he got attacked back this guy was like see tom this is the kind of man you are you let your followers talk to me this way it's like bro you just attacked me for 30 minutes and and literally like it, it's crazy like people could literally say i remember one time somebody pirated my dvds right and i know a lot of people so i was able to get this dude's ip address and get his address his phone number and everything <laughs> and i posted it online i said listen this guy is a thief 
I was the bad guy for posting this. How dare you post his information? I'm like, bro, this guy literally like pirated five thousand dollars worth of my DVDs, and now I'm the piece of garbage. Like, I I just don't understand this way of thinking. But this is the world we live in. You know, it's people could say whatever they want, do whatever they want, and then if there's any consequence whatsoever, oh, they're offended. You know, it's like yeah. you started this war. Like, don't don't start this. You know, just let me yeah. let just let me let me be be nice. Like, why are you busting my chops? You know. You know? You know, you guys just reminded me of a, an idea I had for a TV show. Like every, every time someone talked trash about like a fighter online, we would track the guy down, show up with the TV <laughs> crew to his house, and knock on his door. It's like, hey man, here he is. Is anyone you're gonna punch him in the face? I mean, I always thought to me like, no one's gonna fight, but just the reaction. I think that would have been great television. Imagine like, that you know, Francis Ngannou showing up your front door one morning, and you get some geek. Who's like playing the UFC video game all day? And he opens the door, and Francis Ngannou is like, he would like shit in his pants, man. Like that'd be hilarious. I would pay for that. That's some. Good oh, I would too. Man. I would. I would pay for it too. Like I, I would. Oh, it, it's something that I've learned to accept, and and that's sad that I've learned to accept this because this is just the way people are, you know. I, I will say, I, I just, just like I want to jump in because this, uh, um, I. I, I can kind of understand when I was a teenager, I used to talk a lot of shit online. I, I used to be one of them. <laughs> I'm not going to like, I, I kind of understand the mindset because I think when I was like 16, there were these forums. The, uh, there was a no holds barred forum. Like that uh, NHB, be, NHB gear. Yeah, 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 man. And I used to go on there and talk all sorts of smack. And really, there were, it was about people that I admired. You know, like deep down, I admired them. And I'm thinking, man, that guy's a badass, but he's not my friend. So I'm going to talk shit about him. And all I was looking for was some love. I think that's what it came down to. I just needed someone I admired to say, hey, man, you're, you'll be okay, man. Just train hard and you're going to make it, right? But at some point, you snap out of it and you go, there's only two ways to go about this. I'm either going to become like my hero or I'm just going to die a hater for the rest of my life, you know? So it's like it's a make or break. And I think a lot of these people are just disgruntled and unhappy um, because they have an expectation to be someone and they just don't, they just don't pull the trigger, you know? So a lot yeah. of times when these haters, I mean, I, I get attacked every now and then, you know, like, you know, it's, it's something you deal with. I actually message them privately, like, hey, man, you know, I try to send them a positive message and just be cool with them instead of, like, giving them hate back and talking trash, which I'm not good at to begin with. You know, just try to give them a positive message, like, hey, man, hang in there, you'll be fine, you know, just train hard. You'd be surprised, like, 90% of them are like, yeah, man, you're really cool, I apologize. They just want to say, oh, yeah, and the other 10% don't respond. The other 10% are silent because they're too embarrassed to respond, but 90% of them just wanted some attention. That's all they wanted. I know it's uh you're right it, I had someone mess they I remembered he emailed me really positive like uh a few months back but I I didn't get to it and then today he he out of nowhere like attacked me so I screenshot I went back to his email and I screenshot it and I was like wow there's such a such a contradiction in what you had to say about me two months ago compared to today you know and sometimes <laughs> it's like you know, people also get their feelings hurt. If they message, like, you'll be surprised. Like, sometimes people hate on you because maybe, like, you were at an event and they wanted to take a picture with you, but you just didn't realize that they did and you ended up walking right by them. And they create this issue in their mind that doesn't even exist. If I had students before, I would be on my phone. They walk through the door. I didn't say hi. And then... You know, they think I'm upset with them or mad at them. And just me being like me, I don't think like that as a dude. But a lot of guys are very, very sensitive, you know, and and little things that you don't realize. Like there like there was one hater in particular that I had. Uh, I like him. His name is Hank. Uh, and we follow each other now. And he hated me, bro. And And I'm like, what did I do to make this guy hate me so much? But then I realized... He trained at the last Nogi Worlds. There was a really, really bad call with one of the refs of my students. And I try to compose myself, but this was really bad. And, and I lost my shit a little bit. You know, I got super upset with this ref. He trained with that ref. So right. that was the reason why he hated me because he was loyal to the referee. And I talked a lot of shit. But one thing I respected about Hank 
is he didn't hide behind his keyboard. Like he, his profile was public. He showed his face in his profile and he would just be like, Tom, like go fuck yourself. And I would be like, I'm going to, I'm going like, to see you one day. You know, like I'm going to, I remember your face. And I, I realized finally, because I would look at his profile, like, man, I, I put, I had his name and his face like imprinted in my mind, you know? And I messaged him one day. I'm like, bro, your coach or your, your, your training partner is a dude. I like thrashed at the Nogi world. And I was like, bro, I, I got love for you. Like I respect your loyalty. Cause I would do the same. And now we're cool, you know, but yeah, you know, you can't win, man. No matter what you do, there's always going to be somebody who has something to say. Like I always say, right. Love him or hate him, believe in him or not. Jesus Christ himself was crucified. Right. Uh, if Jesus could get crucified and murdered and betray, what what does any man think that they have that they could do to not get crucified? You know, like we we pale in comparison to to the being that he was and he himself. You know, so I accept it, and I it is you know I laugh at it. Now. I giggle now. I used to get so fired up, but now I just like whatever. I remember the my best internet victory against a troll. I had once posted on Reddit. This was like, man, like 10 years ago maybe. And I had put a picture of me at Serendipities. I went to New York. I taught a seminar. Afterwards, I had the $1,000 golden opulent Sunday. And then uh, I had a bunch of people hating me. Oh, what a waste of money. Oh, I can't believe you would spend $1,000 on an ice cream Sunday. You know, you're a piece of shit. This is that. And I was like, okay, a lot, a lot of people do not like Sundays, apparently. And I'm like, so many expenditure. But one guy went deep, and he's like, if I ever saw you on the street, I would stab you in the stomach and then rape your girlfriend right in front of your dying corpse. And I was wow. like, yeah, I was like, man, that's the strongest threat slash burn I've ever gotten, you know? And I, and I just went to him like, man, what did I do to you? Like, why did I offend you? And then he kept getting madder. And then at a certain point, I broke him. And he's like, dude, you know what? I'm just had a bad day. I'm, I'm sorry, man. I take back what I said. And he deleted all his comments and ended it there. Yeah. And, you yeah, know, it, what's it, wrong with these people? Because like, yeah. like, here's the thing. In face-to-face, -face, he would never talk like that. He would never no. disrespect you. You know, Like I said, listen, I... I, I I go to all these big jujitsu events, people, I'm taking pictures nonstop and everybody, hey, Tom, how are you? And then I go on the computer and it's like, oh, you, you piece of shit. Like, and it's like, wait a second, I was just loved uh, in person, but I don't know. You know, like I said, I wish them well. And, and when you go back. But... No, go sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, when you go back at them, that's exactly what they want. So the best, the, you just got to let, it, it's like a flame. You just got to let the flame die. Just ignore it like they don't exist. You know, the one thing I would say, and it just goes back to what we were talking about earlier, is that, that people get very brave on the internet. And just like people get brave in cars, because they yeah. have this idea that there, there isn't a consequence. It's a free shot. I got a good, I got a good story. Yeah. And you Last know, week. I, I thought... Go ahead. Go ahead, Tom. And listen, I've been in... Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Tom. My son is going crazy. <laughs> Hold on. I, I hear my tornado of the sun. Uh, yeah, it was last week. I was driving, and uh, I, apparently I accidentally cut a guy. I don't think I did cut him off, but he was in a pickup truck, had a beard like Robert, flew up behind me, lost his mind, and I, and I just put my hand up like, bro, like chill and i pulled in the walmart and he did a a u-turn so hard he spun his tires out and like followed me into walmart and for me this is fun you know so i i i pulled over and i'm i don't i don't ever want to get trapped in my car i don't ever want problems you know but if you're gonna follow me i'm gonna i'm gonna be the one to get out you know and i, I just simply got out of my car and I, I'm like a fairly large man right now, you know, and in my town, I'm very well known, you know, and uh, I don't know if you recognize me, if you saw my ears or if you just saw my size. And I was like, hey, bro, I was like, you know, what are you, what are you planning to do? You know, like, what do you want to do right now? But I wasn't mad. I was very calm. And he's like, well, well what, what do you mean what I want to do? I was like, well, you just fought, you just 
viciously <laughs> spun your tires out and followed me into Walmart. Like, are you planning on getting out or you, you just want to, you want to be cool? What do you want to do? It's like, oh yeah, man, I, you know, I don't want no problems, but you don't want no problems. You just attacked me. So if I got out of the car and I, uh, the car and I was five foot one, would you have, would you have attacked me? You know, like would things be different then? It just goes to show, man, like people, they're bullies, you know, they really are. And it's crazy. But the beautiful thing is you can see how quickly someone breaks the second oh. they see they can't bully someone. Because I have a similar story. Someone, I actually cut him off. I, I can be a dick in turn traffic sometimes. Because he wasn't letting me in, so I cut him off, right? And then uh, he followed me, same thing. And I got out of the car, exact same story. And then he starts, like, just looking at me. And next thing you know, he turns around gets back in the car, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you can see, you, you can see how, um, you know, how tough people are on the outer layer. Like everyone see this seen the guy who walks in the gym, he's a bodybuilder, he's tatted up, he looks like a mean murderer Viking, and then he gets triangled by the fourteen year old green belt. And it never and comes you can back. See that, yeah, it, it never comes back. And you can see what a weak person he was, you know? Yeah, and like yeah. some of the toughest people and, and in martial arts you see this. That's one of my favorite things about gym because what martial arts does is it exposes you to yourself. You don't know who you are until you're put under emotional pressure. And fighting is a way of putting you under a lot of emotional stress. And then you see who's who. Are you got a person that's going to quit under pressure or are you a fighter, you know? And then you're always surprised. It's always like the guy that's like nerdy with glasses that has the heart of a lion and the guy who's like super scary on the outside and he's, he's weak. He's like he breaks yeah. with just about anything, you know? You're right, bro. That 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 is, that is the God's honest truth, you know? It, it's like... Uh... It, I had a bodybuilder come in my gym and, and he got, he got beat up by my, my, my brown belt. Who's about 160 pounds. I'm not beat up, but it, he wanted to train live. He wanted to train live. And he never came back after that day. And it's like, you know, he's still taking pictures online and he's making his mean face and he's flexing. It's like, bro, but you look in the mirror, you know who you are. You know what happened that day. You can't run from that, you know? And it's like, I think that's what happens. A lot of the people who talk shit online, they're not exactly happy with who they are as an individual, you know? So they they have some kind of envy, you know, to where it makes them feel better, you know? And I don't know, man, people are funny. It's very easy. Like I always say, like a lot of times when people quit jujitsu, they create problems with their their teammates or their their professor or their gym so they could justify them quitting you know so they could look in the mirror and say no i'm not a quitter this guy was a jerk no in fact you're a quitter just accept the fact that you quit you know and it's very rare like i've had people create me as an enemy because literally i believed in them more than they believed in themselves and then they couldn't live up to that expectation so i'm the bad guy somehow you know and it, it it's one thing I learned is I don't put high expectations on anyone anymore. I put high expectations on their goals. So if somebody comes in, they say, listen, I want to be a world champion. Okay, well, I'm going to attack you like you want to be a world champion. Because if you can't take it, if you can't take it in the gym, what makes you think you could take it under the bright lights? What makes you think that you could lose and come back to the internet and get destroyed by people that you don't know and live to train another day after that? The emotional abuse that you'll suffer. And then if they decide they don't want to be a competitor anymore, well, I still love them the same. I'll treat them like a, a civilian, you know, just a normal student who trains from nine to five. I have one student, you know, he wants to compete. He wants to compete. And every time he gets tired, he starts coughing. Like, like, but it's, it's bullshit, you know? And, and I'm like, he was in a competition and he started doing this in the middle of the competition. And it's like, man, like, you're my student. Like, man up right now. You know what I mean? Just finished. And it was a local competition. So the ref didn't want to, like, disqualify him. And the opponent didn't know what to do. And I'm, I looked at his opponent. And I'm like, attack him. Like, go after him right now. <laughs> and uh, you got to learn, man. You know, like, you can't just quit when things get tough. Because shit is always anything worthwhile is going to be tough. And I think we've all had op we've all had moments in our life that – we wish we could play back and do things differently because maybe, maybe we wouldn't necessarily quit, but we know we could have done just a little bit more, right? And it's okay that these things happen. And it doesn't mean we're a failure, 
but we don't run from it. We come back and we try to correct that. We come back and we try to get better. Like I remember when I first started competing, a five minute match felt like an eternity. Like literally I would come off after five, six minutes and the lactic acid buildup would be so extreme. Like I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't do another match to where as a black belt, I have no time on the match for 63 minutes and you're not tired because you just get used to, to being under the, in the fire, you know? And again, like I said, does it always go your way? No. Like I, I, I don't know if, if when I fight, I believe in myself and my talents and I really believe in my, my stand up. but listen, like if the only thing I could really promise is that I've been in tough positions before and I'm ready to fight hard. You know, I'm ready to do my best and give my best. And that 15 minutes is going to come and it's going to go. Right. And in our minds, we start to create this illusion that, man, it's, it's much, I wish I was in the crowd right now. Like, let's just get this over with. You have to remember the hard work that you put forth, you know, the suffering that you've put forth. So when the time comes and things get tough, just know that that 15 minutes is going to be gone. And what you do within that time is going to determine how you look at yourself in the mirror after that, you know? And I remember my, 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 uh, my Bellator, my first fight in Bellator, you know, I, I had a very, very tough decision loss in the UFC and I felt I could have done more. I took the fight on short notice, 12 days notice. I lost a very, very tough decision. And then my first, fight in Bellator, the first round was the first time I've ever been beat up on my feet. I've never lost a round on my feet. And I went back after the first round and I sat down and I, and I just made a choice. Like we're going to, we're going to find the way. Right. But here's the thing. If I didn't suffer that one fight, I don't know if I would have had it in me to come back the second round and win. But since I I've tasted defeat, and I had to look at myself in the mirror when I felt maybe I could have done more. I didn't want to feel that again, you know? So I think once people understand that their shortcomings, like that bodybuilder who got beat up by the 160 pounder, it's not bad. It's not a bad thing. Make it a positive, come back and find a way, you know, and get better and get better. Like that's the thing. Everybody wants the quick fix, right? In jujitsu, there's no quick fix. There's none. You have to put your work in. You have to put your time in. And even after you put your time in, you're still going to get your ass whooped sometimes. And it is just, it is what it is. Yeah. And I think that it's sometimes a curse with people who are naturally gifted or who are really good. Or like you say, someone who is strong or a bodybuilder that they may have not tasted defeat before or yeah. not in defeat in that way. So they're not used to it. And the first time they taste it, they don't know how to handle it or, they, and they just back out entirely. And sometimes I think that's the benefit of being the guy who isn't naturally talented or who isn't an athlete, because you probably tasted defeat many times before and you're kind of used to it. And you know, like, I just got to grind my way through this thing. You know, I felt okay. like, I felt like myself, I wasn't like when I started doing wrestling, I was really out of shape. I was what in ninth or 10th grade, I was 200 pounds at five. You know? So I wasn't <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right yeah so and i remember my brother and i we would have to run like our coach tierso just came out of lock haven d1 school and he was young he was like 25 and he would run the training sessions like essentially how he ran the how his coach did his college practices because i remember the, the first day we had 60 people by the end of the season we had six like it just weeded <laughs> all these kids out and every day, this practice started with a three-mile Indian run. And my brother and I, the only times we would run a mile was, like, for the physical. You know, when they would tell you like, in school, like, oh, I'll run to check your time. And I couldn't run a mile consecutively. I remember we would do, like, half a block, and then I'd have to walk, and then <laughs> jog and walk. And that grind happened for, like, three months, where... <laughs> It took me three months before I was able to complete the run without stopping once. And the, the funny thing was, after that, I've never walked in my life ever again, regardless of the shape I've been. I've done 15-mile runs, 10-mile runs, in no shape whatsoever. Like, huh. I remember my girlfriend or my, my ex-wife at the time, she was training for a half marathon. And she's like, oh, I need somebody to, to run with me. And I was like... Okay, I'll run with you. And I didn't realize she was doing 10 miles. I'm like, son of a bitch. All right. 
<laughs> here, here we go. You know what I mean? But like, I never had to stop. It's like, it's just a mental fortitude, but it's like you said, like once you know what it's like, you're able to push yourself. But if you never give yourself that chance to lose and eat it and then, okay, how do I not lose next time? Or how do I do better than I did last time? Well, that's the thing. Like you have to get used to being tired. Like, I, I remember the first fight that I lost, like, bro, like, I've never felt an exhaustion like that. Like, I was getting my face bashed in, I couldn't breathe, my nose is broken, I'm choking on blood, I haven't been there before, and this was new. And listen, not at one point that I think of rolling over and quitting, but at that time, I also didn't think of winning. And that right there is losing. At that time, I thought of, God damn, I need to make it through this fight. The moment you think like that, you're just surviving. You're not winning. Yeah. But now, I've been there, right? Like, I remember my the last ADCC trials I did, the first match, I was exhausted. And I actually laughed to myself. I was like, bro, you've been here before. This is your mind playing tricks on you. But if you're not used to that feeling, you're like, it's like quicksand. You panic, right? Yeah. You get nervous. You're not used to that suffering. You have to get used to it. Like, now, like... You know, I'm ripping through pads, and I'm not in, like, great shape right now, but, like, like you said, you just get used to being tired and performing when you're tired. To where that has to – that takes time, you know? If people take a break every time they're tired, they'll never get to the next level, you know? They'll never know what it feels like to reach their own personal best. And, listen, my middle-aged students and stuff, I tell them, take your break, take a round off, whatever. We're going to be a competitor, man. Like, get your shit together, you know? Like, that's it. Yeah, I think that's a secret. Like I always tell people, like you wanna, well, a lot of people, especially pro fighters, they fear getting tired, right? Like they're like, what happens yeah. if, if I gas? You know, and as a result, they pace themselves in fighting, which can end up causing them to lose because they don't score enough points or they try to coast on a round that they thought they won and they lost. But like you said, the secret to not getting tired is understanding you will get tired and you're okay with that. And it's yes. gonna happen. You know what I mean? Like, Frank Gager told me tired. that before. Yeah, and you like, and that's how I've always approached it. Like when I would compete, I would listen to breathing, because when I would hear my competitor, my opponent go, <sighs> I'm like, you know, that's more, it. Yeah, he's tired now, and maybe he's not used to fighting at this pace, but I can fight tired. You know, yeah. I'm fine with fighting tired. You know, you and know like you said, uh, it's, it's people who push themselves. Like, we, if you're afraid to lose, like even in training. You don't push yourself hard because you know yeah. if I go too hard, I'm gonna gas, and then I'm, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna lose to a guy I know I shouldn't lose to. So instead, I'm just gonna coast and not push hard. I've always done like shark bait rounds when I was like getting ready, and I would lose to guys who were blue belts and whatnot because I'd be doing 45 minutes straight every time I tap somebody out, a new person comes in. Eventually, someone's gonna get me. You know what I mean, but I'm fine with that because I'm getting to learn how to fight tired and the type of mistakes I'm gonna make when I get tired and how to avoid that in the future. But, you know, it's just like you said, if you don't expose yourself to that, then you never know and you're going to get surprised. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, one thing I, I always tell myself, like, I don't mind getting tired at all. I actually like it. It always sucks when you get tired and they don't. Like, when this guy's got, like, stupid cardio. That's, that's the part that sucks. Like, I don't mind. My, in fact, like, to me, it's like, if I'm dead and the other guy's dead, I like it because I know I won't break. You know, like I, yeah. I, my strategy, if I can wear you out and I'm going, I know I'm not going to quit. I know myself, right? There's no, but it just sucks when you're like, okay, I'm getting really tired here and you're not getting that same uh, feedback from the other side. Up. It's like, man, please get tired. You know? Yeah, I agree. They say fatigue makes cowards of men, right? Uh, they, and it's funny. Yeah, and then I heard another. Gable. Yeah. Is that what yeah. he says? Is he the one? I think Gable. Yeah. Cowards of us all. Yeah. And then another great quote was, make yourself tired because when you're tired, your opponent's exhausted, you know? And, man, people, like, what a shame to go through life and, and never feel that that feeling of just you can't use what well, you think. You can't do more, but you still find a way. Like, it is hell, you know? Like, bro, it's funny. I used the I, I put on a weighted vest today. That's the first time I ever wore a weighted vest, and I did five five-minute rounds punching the bag. Bro, like it was during the kids' class, I was literally breathing like I was having a stroke, right? Like I was embarrassed. I was literally embarrassed, but I was like, what's going to be more embarrassing if I stop and take the vest off or if I just finish, right? Yeah. And it's like, it, it's still not comfortable, but you just get used to being uncomfortable. 
You know, like you you make a bed in hell and you sleep there. And like one one of the things for me is like my life has been very uncomfortable. Like there's been many times that like you know, shit, man. Like especially from a young kid, that you deal with things that it's crazy. So it's like, and we've already been here before. Like we've 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 tasted uncomfort before, whether it's emotionally, physically, you know, we've suffered before, right? And and I feel when we get too complacent, when we stop pushing ourselves, you know, we re- we regress. Like there's no such thing as just staying the same. We're either progressing or we're regressing. We're never just staying the same. True. And and you know, I got a little lazy for a while. Not lazy, but I was just so obsessed with teaching. I I, I wasn't training for like since August, really. I had a super fight in Kasai. Then I wasn't really training. I was just teaching every day. Then I started training again and like a month ago. And then I just signed with one and like, man, it's like I'm training seven days a week. And my students that aren't used to seeing me do that, like some of my new students, I see them looking at me. They're like, is this the way that w- should we be doing this? You know what I mean? Like, why is he training so hard? Like, why is he literally look like he's going to die every training session? And that doesn't mean you're sparring hard, but you're just pushing yourself. Like we're hitting pads, whatever it may be. Like it shouldn't be comfortable. You know, like, because listen, a fight is never comfortable, right? Competition is never comfortable. Like, unless we get a quick submission, you know, damn well, you're three minutes in, four minutes in, no matter how good of shape you're in, you're tired. I don't know why it, you're just tired. You just learn to perform under that, under that pressure. And it, it's, it's funny, man. It's, uh, it's, it's experience for sure. Yeah. And I, I think it's important just as a person to have that experience in your back pocket because it translates to all sorts of areas in your life that makes you work harder for your family your relationships and you, your work you know whatever if it whatever it may be i know for myself uh one of the most uncomfortable situations i've been in before which was uh i was scuba diving i, I don't know if i told you the story robert this might be a new one for you but uh i was in the galapagos and the, my girlfriend had booked the trip and i thought you know, we're going to this place, which is like once in a lifetime type thing. I should scuba dive there, but I wasn't trained. So we went the quick course, like two days, learned how to scuba dive, and then went to the Galapagos and to do uh, diving. And the, I remember I told the dive instructor, I'm like, look, we're newbies. I got like three dives on my belt. Make sure we don't hurt ourselves or do anything stupid. He's like, oh, don't worry. I got you. And there's only like four of us in the group. And it's the very last dive of the trip. Everything's been going great. And we dive. The equipment we're using is crappy. It's like rental stuff. So my depth gauge is broken. I don't know how deep I'm going. I'm just trusting the dude, like, wherever he's going, that it's okay. We end up getting, like, there's a little, like, cave. And we start to dip in there. And my vision just starts to blur. And I was like, whoa, what's going on? And then when I went to dive in again to follow them, my vision starts to fade to black. Oh, wow. I start to reach for my girlfriend, but I miss. And then, boom, it's just pitch black, complete darkness. I can't see anything. I'm still conscious, but I'm totally blind. And I didn't know that at the time, but I was 95 feet underwater. You know, And we're, almost, we're like 25 minutes into the dive, so that's probably about like, five to 10 minutes left of air. And then I think, okay, compose myself. I get my flashlight. I start trying to flash signal people, you know, hit my tank. After two minutes, no response. So I'm still blind, two minutes. And then I start weighing my options. I'm like, well, what am I going to do here? All right. And I'm like, well, I could try to swim to what I think is up, which is tricky when you're underwater and there's a lot of current. I tried that a couple minutes. I felt the ocean floor. There was too much current. I didn't know where I was going. I kept getting stuck in the bottom. So I was thinking, well, I either fill up my tank. This is which... fucking terrible. This is <laughs> terrible. I'm getting anxiety thinking, hearing this. I know. I'm thinking, how many tricks? Like it's in my idea, my head. It's so easy to know where up is, but you're right. Underwater, you lose track of where up and down oh, is. You'd be like you're floating horrible. in limbo. Yeah, it's oh what I'm thinking. God. Never I, scuba dive. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> Never. I, so I think, 
I have to fill my BC, which is your buoyancy control device, right? You can put air in it. And then what happens is you start shooting up, but the, the higher you get, the faster you go. So you end up going like a rocket, which does all sorts of damage to your <laughs> ears and the, the barotrauma and all that. So I'm like, this, that, that's a last resort option. Because if I ever do that, I have to be taken to a decompression center and I'm in the Galapagos. There ain't shit around here, right? So there's a good chance I'll end up dying later. But at least I won't drown underwater. I'm like, well, what's my other option? I'm like, well, wait a little bit more, but I don't know how much air I have left. So at a certain point, I'm like, you know what? Let me take my mask off because I'm blind, but I'm still conscious. So I took the mask off, put it back on, cleared it. And I ended up restoring my vision by doing that. I apparently I had too much pressure on the mask. I wasn't equalizing properly. But I was seeing like double vision. I was seeing everything double. My eyes were all fucked. But... It was enough where I could safely ascend. I was able to come up, recover. When I looked in the mirror, I looked like from Total Recall when Arnold's on Mars and the eyes started to pop out because the, the mask was actually sucking my eyeballs out. Oh, my and that's God. What, that's what caused the, the blindness. But after that experience, I remember when I went to sleep, I would hear the sound of the ocean. I was like, mm, and it would trip me out because I was like, I remember being stuck at the bottom of the ocean, not being able to see in that sound. <laughs> That's so, traumatic, man. That's crazy. Well, like what, what I learned from it, what was the first thing I did? I booked another trip. I'm like, I'm not going to let my last experience deter me from overcoming this because I'm not going to live with this BS fear because I made a, a, a rookie mistake. And now I have like 150 more dives under my belt haven't had problems and I retrained so I got better. You know, but to me, it, like I've I've talked yeah, to you're spoken on your to own there, bro. I, I still don't want to do it, man. That was on my bucket list. It just got <laughs> canceled. After yeah, that. I don't, I don't, you made, I you made it sound horrible, Dave. No, but I'm telling you what, what someone told me because I have a student who's a rescue diver. He's like, most people I know would be dead, even professionals, because that's such a rare thing that happened to you. Like I've never heard of someone losing vision because of a mask squeeze. He's like, the only thing that saved you was your black belt because you've been yeah. in those tough, the tough spots. You've been, in those, you've been there and, before. And I have been in plenty of <laughs> tough spots. Chokes that I've held out long, but I'm still able to think, how am I going to win? How am I going to get out of this? You know? yeah. And that maybe saved my life. You know? So I feel like you, you have to put yourself in that position. And I feel like the martial arts is the one thing that can bring you as close to death as possible without maiming you you know what i mean like you don't you don't have to worry about losing an arm or anything like that yeah. you, you can go out there and be a warrior and, and you, even if you're not competing just in the gym you know you can have a gym war and test yourself absolutely so you, man. So you know what it's like absolutely so i feel like it's a shame especially you know if you're a man you know, we need to challenge ourselves physically like if you don't actually go out there and, and learn the limits of your body you know i agree totally i agree well, um, Dave, uh, you got anything else you want to ask Tom? I, I, I got, I got my kids, man. I got to get going. They're, they're pretty cranky at me right now. Okay, yeah, mine uh, too. But, uh, <laughs> We're mine too. Tower Park. So yeah. I'll, I'll let Tom. Uh, you have anything you want to plug or let people know where they can find you online? Yeah, just Tom the Blast. Uh, I appreciate you guys. For those of you guys, uh, listen well if they're listening to this they obviously know who you guys are you know definitely two two men that i respect very much and Thanks, appreciate dude. all that you've given back to the jiu-jitsu world you always have my my respect and admiration for sure and uh you know true legends man you know so much love for me anything you guys ever need you let me know likewise tom um if you ever come out to vegas you can join me and dave are starting a movement master adcc master division it's me, Dave Slovato. You're invited. Old man. Let's do it, bro. So we can stay I love it. The F away from the young guns because they're too fast. And like, I can't help the fact that my reflexes aren't as sharp as they were. We don't need know. them, man. You know, but I, I, I'm waiting for my old man strength. It's going to kick in soon enough. I don't know what's well, I got the old man bone to join. It's the strength that's missing. I don't know what's It's going to happen I, soon, bro. I'm, it's it's got to happen eventually. And then we should have a, a ADCC Masters camp here just for shits and giggles. So if you're ever in Vegas, man, please stop by. Say hello. I would love check that. It out. You're doing great things. And, uh, yeah, man, keep it up. Thank you so much for being on the show. 
I think Thank that we can get nearly a, enough out. I think we should do this again sometime soon, right, Dave? Yeah, for sure. You know, I always like hearing from you, Tom, and I, I follow you on social media a lot because I like that you're very frank and straightforward. You're not apologetic about your your positions, you know. And I don't necessarily agree with everything you say, but I, you know, I like that you're there. You're not fake. You know what I mean? So I, I appreciate oh. the realness. The, the you, world man. would be boring if we all agreed. Yeah, I appreciate you guys. Have a wonderful night, fellas. Yep. Thank you so much, Tom. We'll do this again soon, okay? Love you guys. Take Thank you. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.